I just got back from the most amazing cruise ever. Um, we went to Alaska and Alaska was something that was on my bucket list. And I just want to acknowledge and thank everybody who accompanied me on that cruise, not just the people who helped me out, my producer, Ebis, and of course, my intrepid husband, Danny, and my um, social media manager, and also my road manager, Milena Joy Morris. So, I mean, there was, uh, there was a whole bunch of people on our team, but the audience, oh my God, um, the audience really touched me and m touched me and moved me. And um, one of the reasons I love face-to-face -face live events is because it's an opportunity for me to meet you and get to know you. It's so interesting because I'm here doing these um, Facebook Lives and you read my books and you all know me. But when I meet you in person, that's my opportunity to get to know you. And that's why I love those events. Now, I don't know if any of you've noticed, but um, we have two unicorns back here. Freddie seems to have found a mate and he found his mate in Alaska. So how did that come about? I wanted to start by just telling you that. So Freddie didn't come to Alaska. I didn't take him on, uh, on the tour with me. But while I was on the cruise, a beautiful lady who was from my audience came up to me and she presented me with uh, another unicorn and she said, this is Frida and she thought that Freddie deserved to have a partner and I thought that was so cute and so darling of her to do that. So I accepted her gift and it came with a note where she spoke about synchronicities and how she was guided to get this unicorn and guided to come on the cruise and she asked for guidance. So we received so much guidance overall on the Alaskan cruise. I know I did, I know my team did, I know my audience did, and I, that's why I was inspired to actually speak today a little bit about conversations through the veil. I wanted to speak about how we receive guidance from the other side, in what form they come, and what sort of arena that is most inviting for the guidance to come. So one of the things I noticed was that, um, or I have noticed over the years, is that when I'm in a setting where I am really relaxed, and when I am in what I call a low density setting, um, it's uh, a low density setting would be a setting or an area that is not overly populated, not urbanized, not in a high rise apartment or office building downtown somewhere. When I am sort of in nature by the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, on my way to Alaska, in the middle of um, on a cruise ship, I find the guidance comes so much easier. When I'm uh, 3000 feet on an airplane, I get guidance so much easier. And so one of the reasons I wanted to speak about this subject this week is because I've noticed in the last few weeks, I have been receiving a lot of emails and um, questions from you about what happens on the other side. Many of you have been writing to me about losing loved ones. And I've noticed on my discussion forums and pages that people are writing that they've lost their spouse recently or their mother recently, and they miss them tremendously. And that's why I hope that this uh, episode will actually help you out on that. So first of all, I often feel that I'm guided by Wayne. And I want to tell you some of the synchronicities or the guidance that came to me during the cruise. And then we'll get into how you can open yourself up to a little more guidance. Also, I would love to take questions from you. So please start writing them. So my wonderful husband, Danny, who is behind the scenes, he can start looking for the questions and I can answer them. Um, usually what he looks for are questions that are related to the subject, the topic that I'm talking about. So that's kind of the, the preference. But um, if we run out of those questions, we may go into other different kinds of questions. So anyway, while I was on this cruise, what was really interesting is um, one of the things that happens when you are on, I don't know if it's every cruise line or this particular cruise line, um, it was Holland America, is that every night when you go to your room, um, you know, the, the housekeepers or the, the stewards of the ship, they, they kind of fix your room. They turn down your bed, but not only do they do that, but they make an animal shape out of towels. And, and so literally they roll and fold towels. And every night when you go to your room, 
there's a different animal sitting on your bed made out of towels. And they put these funny little uh, googly doll eyes on, on the animal. And each night it's something different, like it could be a whale, it could be a tortoise, it could be a rabbit, it could be a monkey, it could be anything. So what happened is that on the evening that I got my, I got the unicorn from somebody in, on the cruise, I put the unicorn in my room and then that night before going to bed, I, I went into my room to go to bed and it turned out that that night the animal that was made <clears throat> by the stewards was an elephant. And so there's these towels rolled up as, as into an elephant and what they'd done is they'd taken the unicorn off the table in the room and put it next to the elephant. Now I thought, how cute, I walked in and there was a unicorn and an elephant in my bed and I thought, how cute is that? And it didn't occur to me at the time. But the next day when Milena came into the room and I showed her the unicorn and the elephant and and she put two and two together and she said that's a sign from Wayne. It was probably Wayne that asked them to put the unicorn next to the elephant because you're the unicorn, Wayne is the elephant and he's trying to show you he's guiding you, he's on your side and I thought wow what a great observation. See the thing is Wayne would always tell this story about, a, about being a scurvy elephant and I'm sure you guys can Google that story, but it was about how when he was a kid, his teachers, he, he went home one day and said his teacher called him a scurvy elephant. Actually, what his teacher said was that he was a disturbing element. And so after Wayne had passed, I noticed elephant symbols showing up in a lot of places. And so every time I see an elephant I kind of think oh that's a signal from Wayne but on that night there was an elephant and a unicorn side by side so that was really really kind of fun so that was one symbol I had but throughout the cruise everybody noticed that they were feeling guided I remember one at one point I was on the stage and I started talking and I said something about my dad and then and then I said I'm sure my dad is right here. And in that moment, the, the ship actually rocked and we all felt it. And I was like, whoa, that was my dad letting me know he was here. So there was like so many things. But another really fun one, which um, I'm going to ask Milena to post this photo later, is that we were walking through Seattle, which is where we docked when we got off the ship. And so we docked in Seattle and before heading to the airport to fly back, we had quite a few hours. So we decided to walk around downtown Seattle. We walked around Pike's Place Market, uh, Pike Place Market. And then Milena spotted a sign, well, not really a sign, like a poster. It was a wall of lots of posters and graffitis overlapping each other. But what stood out was the words, be the light. And I think it was an ad for a beer ad, but, uh, but anyway, the words were really clear, be the light. So she said to me, stand by those words and I'll take a photo of you for Facebook. So I just stood by those words and she took the photo. After she took the photo and looked at it like hours later or the next day, she noticed that the words be the light was actually on an elephant. We hadn't seen it. It was such a big um, picture, like the poster, was so big that the head of the elephant and the trunk kind of came around it, but so much of the picture was covered that you, you really had to stand back and see the whole thing. So we were able to see it on the photo that it was an elephant. So that was really interesting and she posted that and so we took that as a sign from Wayne saying be the light. But it got even better than that. Somebody then posted below that if you look at the end of the trunk, it looks like they are holding an orange. And so I looked and it was like, oh my God, there is an orange at the end of the trunk. Now it could be an orange light bulb or I think it's trying to be a light bulb because it's be the light. But I swear, if you look at it, it does look like an orange and Wayne's fruit was orange. He would always have an orange on stage with him. Um, and I remember the first time I spoke on stage after he passed away and I was doing a memorial for him, an orange appeared on the table and nobody claimed to have put it there. Um, so it's, an orange is another symbol for me, for Wayne. Um, a third symbol for me, which has nothing to do with the cruise, is that one of the last 
videos of Wayne I had watched before he passed away was the one he had done on Monarch Butterflies. He played it at one of his events. It's a really old video. And up until he passed away, I had never noticed Monarch Butterflies around me. I don't even think I remembered in my head having seen one. But after he passed away, um, and that video stayed ingrained in my mind because he took the monarch butterfly to be a message from his deceased loved one. And so if you can Google it, it's still there on Google. It's still there on YouTube. So Google Wayne Dyer monarch butterflies and you'll see that video. Anyway, after Wayne passed away, I started noticing monarch butterflies show up for me like crazy. And it felt like, it feels like they follow me around. And um, I step out of my house and there's usually a monarch butterfly waiting for me. And if I don't see one, I kind of call on one. I say, monarch butterfly, where are you? Or I go, Wayne the butterfly, where are you? And sure enough, one will show up in front of my face. So those are some of like many, many synchronicities that uh, or signs that I get from Wayne. I get different kinds of signs from my dad, very different kinds of signs. I know that Wayne is able to communicate with um, so many of you because he touched so many of you. And the more people that know someone that has deceased, the more that they can touch them. So let me explain a little bit by what I mean by this. Um, for example, my dad, because not as many people knew my dad as knew Wayne. So my dad's mission on the other side is not as big as Wayne's mission, but it doesn't make him less important and it doesn't make him any less of a soul or a spirit than Wayne's. That over here in this realm of duality, we kind of think in hierarchy and we think some people are higher than others, but they aren't necessarily. You know, once we cross over, some people have... Um, smaller missions, some have bigger missions, some have different missions, but there isn't exactly like a hierarchy. So Wayne, because when he was in the physical, he touched so many people. He had a big mission before he even came into this world. That was something that he signed up for. Each of us, we kind of know what our mission is before we, we enter into this world. And so with Wayne, because he touched so many different people and moved so many people and so many people mourned his passing, he is able to continue to touch all those people even after he has crossed over. I actually believe that he had completed his mission here. He had gone as far as he could as a physical being, but he needed, he needed to do more. He desired to do more, but the physical, this world of duality, this world of the physical limits us as to how much we can do and how many people we can touch because it's a slower, it's a more denser reality than the non-physical. So he needed to cross over in order to get his message even bigger. And what he does today is that he actually guides other people, other teachers, other healers, whose message is in line with his and helps them to get out there more so that the message gets wider and bigger. I believe that's probably what the Buddha did and what Jesus did and all the other teachers before us. And that is something we can do when we cross over. I had a question from someone this week who asked if everything that we do, if all our memories and everything that we are is lost when we cross over. So I believe that what I just explained is that it's not lost. And I think that if you really live your if you if, sorry, if you live your life to the fullest and take yourself as far as you can in this physical, when you cross over, you will continue to do it in a bigger way. But here's the bonus of what happens when we cross over. When we cross over, we do it without the limitations without the challenges, the challenges, the limitations, they're good for us while we're here. We need them while we're here because it's also very easy for us to go, um, go astray and get too much into our mind instead of our heart. Very often our challenges 
push us back to lead, push us back into our heart so that we lead from the heart as opposed to leading from the mind. Um, and so we need challenges. But when we're on the other realm, we only lead from the heart or from the soul, which is even deeper than the heart. So we don't need the challenges. So we are boundless and we're able to share our message in a bigger way. And that's why someone like Wayne crossed over when he was at a point in his life when he was still fully healthy and fully well. He had healed from the leukemia and he was going strong. And that for him was the perfect time to cross over because he was starting to feel the limitations of this physical world. So if you have lost somebody recently um, and you are still mourning and grieving them, first of all, I would like you to know that don't judge yourself. It can take time to get over their, the physical loss of not having them around. If you are not yet sensing messages and signs from them, don't beat yourself up. My friend Geraldine Glass, who lost her son, said that when she is at her happiest, she is at her lightest, and that's when she feels the communication from him the most. But when she is depressed and down and feeling low and small, that's when she finds that she's not getting his communication. So we seem to think that we get down because we're not getting communication from them. Um, I sense, and also from what Geraldine said, that it's the other way around. When we allow ourselves to get completely depressed and down, that's when it's hardest for them to get through to us because that's when our energy is at our densest. However, if you are feeling depressed and grieving and down, don't beat yourself up. Just embrace yourself for who you are at that moment. Love yourself more. Allow yourself the time to climb out of it. Gently help yourself to climb out of it, but do it gently with no judgment for being in that state, for being in that depression. Don't force yourself to be with people um, that put pressure on you to cheer up. And if you know someone who is going through grief, the best thing you can do is just be there for them and allow them to be who they are. Don't force them or have any expectations from them. And just tell someone who's going through grief that I'm here for you. Whenever you need me, I'm here. Um, those are the best kinds of things. Now, in order to allow for, oh, and by the way, <clears throat> Gerilyn Glass is a beautiful sound healer who plays the crystal bowls and she was also on the cruise and she created some amazing music on the cruise. Um, that cruise has made me realize that really I want to do a lot more cruises. So I hope you guys can join me next time, but um, I'll be planning one soon. I'll be planning one for next year. So stay tuned and I'll be telling you about more cruises. For me, it was pretty magical. And I realized that's really the way I like to teach apart from online. So online and cruises, that's, that's my thing. But I know, of course, I will have to do some other live events that are not on cruises because I know some of you do get seasick. So um, there will be a lot more live events as we move forward. But anyway, I also wanted to acknowledge all the other people that came and um, a beautiful woman by the name of Hei who flew in from Taiwan gave me this mug. Um, there were people there from all over the world. I, I actually remember you. I remember your names. I remember your faces. And so I'm so grateful for you all to have come on the cruise. Um, so a couple of things, if you are not receiving messages, but you really want them, interestingly, that that is the dichotomy. The more you force them, the more that energy is actually pushing the messages away. So what I suggest is just relax, allow yourself to get into a space where it doesn't matter whether you get them or not. Just know you are loved. Your loved ones love you. They may not be sending messages to you for a couple of reasons. They may feel that you don't need them. You're doing great without them, or they may be feeling that your energy is too dense at the moment, but don't beat yourself up for it. Always, always be gentle with yourself. Always no judgment on yourself for going through grief, for going through pain, for going through depression. People who read the, the books that, you know, most of us teachers write, people who attend our workshops, listen to our 
videos, you guys are usually the hardest on yourselves. You guys are kind of saying to yourselves, I should get this by now. I should know this by now. And you beat yourselves up for being hard on your, you beat yourself up for feeling things that you believe you shouldn't be feeling. You're human. You will always feel things. I go through doubts. I go through stuff all the time. So the, the main thing is to love yourself through them and to not judge yourself and not beat yourself up and trust that you will come out of it. You will climb out of it. Your loved ones are not suffering. They are actually free. They're completely free and they are fine. You need to do what it takes to heal yourself. And it doesn't matter how your loved ones went, even if they took their own life, they are not suffering. They may be learning or realizing how they could have done things differently, but they're not in pain. They're not suffering. It takes a lot of pain for someone to take their own life. And what they don't want is for you to feel guilty if they took their own life. They would want you to know it's not your fault. It is absolutely not your fault. There is nothing you could have done. It was a whole series of things that caused them to take their life. So do not feel guilty. The best thing you can do is to heal yourself, heal your guilt, um, and allow yourself to find your joy again. And don't feel guilty when you find your joy. And I am now actually going to turn to my intrepid um, husband, Danny, and tech guru. Uh, do we have any questions? Actually, we have quite a few comments, Yay. quite a few questions, but I suspect somewhere under your desk, you're actually reading the the questions I've got queued up on my monitor because you've answered every one of them. <laughs> the last question I had queued up was from Doug Quinn who says, I've never had any guidance from my deceased parents. Father died when I was 10. You speak about receiving guidance from crossed over people all the time. How does that happen? And you just answered that question even before I brought it up. So somewhere under that table, you've actually got, uh, you're actually connected <laughs> to the monitor I've got queued up. Here. No, I'm connected to you, your, your mind, your head. <laughs> All right. So while we wait for more questions to come in, I will say there's been hundreds and hundreds of comments that are saying, if you're going to do another cruise, we're coming. People Yay. absolutely love you. Uh, hello from the UK, uh, Anita. Your reminders to be kind to ourselves is such a, a valuable reminder for so many people. Um, let's see, I'm scrolling here. Love your teachings, Anita, from Aww. Marta Gillian. Um, Tyne Ulrich, love what you're telling. Oh my. Uh, Martina Stipich just sends you big hearts. Um, so I'm just sitting here just waiting for questions that are actually going to trip you up. So folks, if you've got complicated questions, please send them to me. Yes, you've got to help Danny out, send questions. But I do want to elaborate more on the question you just had from from the gentleman who said his parents, his, um, could you read that out again? It was, if from, it was from Doug Quinn. Who Doug says, Quinn. I never, I have never had any guidance from my deceased parents. Father died when I was 10. You speak about receiving guidance from crossed over people all the time. How does that happen? So here's the thing. Um, I think also what happens is that we don't realize that we are receiving guidance. And so I wanted to circle back to this point because, so let me give you an example. Um, when I walked into my cabin on the ship that day when the elephant and the unicorn were next to each other, um, and I'm going to ask Milena if she's around, if she can find the photo of it to post it. But anyway, when the elephant and the unicorn were together, I don't think, like whoever did that, the person on the ship who did that, who, um, who was helping to tidy my room, um, I would, um, you know, I wish I could, I knew who it was so that I could give him a hug, but I don't think he even realized, and I know it was a he because everybody on our floor were, seemed to be men, but, um, 
uh, I don't think he realized that he was being guided by Wayne. And he, something inspired him to just do that, to move my unicorn from the table and put it next to the elephant that he had just created. So I guess my point is, Doug, that maybe you are receiving guidance in the way of inspiration from your dad all the time, but you don't, you don't um, interpret it as guidance from your dad. And I think a lot more people receive guidance than realize, but they don't interpret it as that. They think it's an idea that they have just got from their brain. But a lot of these ideas we get, the creativity, um, all of this stuff that comes through us, it's not generated from our brain. It is actually generated from something much higher, a connection we have to the universe. And this connection could be to our own um, deceased loved ones. And if you've lost a loved one when you're older, you recognize that as coming from that person. You were only 10 and your dad is probably still guiding you and you probably don't recognize it as his guidance and you just think it's your own creative ideas. Here's another thing that I have noticed that generally happens in the world. Um, so basically, number one is that, that that wonderful person who put the unicorn next to the elephant probably wasn't even aware he was receiving guidance from Wayne. He probably thought it was his own creative idea. That's number one. The other thing that I've noticed is that have you ever noticed when there is a great idea or a movement or something big happens in one country and one part of the world, you will see it happening simultaneously in another part of the world and it's happened in such a short time where it's not that the information has traveled by word of mouth or by the internet from one part to the other. It's like when an idea whose time has come, it seems to just sprout in different countries, different parts of the world, in different languages at the same time. And each one is claiming it as their own idea. That is divine guidance. That is guidance. It's not people learning the idea from each other. It's like there is a divine guidance on a massive scale happening at the same time, probably from ascended masters who, have, who are now at the state where they can touch so many other, so many people at the same time. And they deliberately do so in different parts of the world, trying to generate new technology or generate peace or a movement of some kind because the time has come for that. The people are ready for that. And so they plant it in certain people who have perhaps who have a big following or who have an audience. They plant it in certain people at the same time in different parts of the world. So we are receiving guidance all the time, but we're not aware of it and we're not always aware of who to attribute it to. So yeah, I just wanted to say that particularly for you, Doug. I'm sure you're receiving guidance, but you're just not aware of it. Um, any more questions? We have another question, and I apologize in advance. I don't know how to pronounce your name properly. I will try. It's Dilwert Dulert, uh, who says, can you talk more about a twin soul connection? Okay, so um, now I tend not to use terms like twin souls and soulmates. It's not a term I commonly use. And the reason I don't use them, but I will still tell you my take on it. The reason I don't use them is because there seem to be different interpretations on these. Like people do feel that even somebody who has hurt you really, really badly, but which has in the long run helped you in your life is also a soulmate. And there are others who say someone who is here to accompany you on your whole journey and be there by your side and who you love unconditionally regardless of what happens in life is a soulmate. So, um, so if I were to use these words, the way that I would use them is that a soulmate is someone from your, I would say from your soul cluster who could be people that you get along with and don't get along with, but who you kind of knew that you would be spending this life 
seeing, meeting. You know, it could be someone who is a spouse who turns out to be abusive or who turns out to be a narcissist. But at some point before you came in, you kind of agreed for them to be in your life so that you could then close a circle with them and move on or something, or maybe so that they could get the lesson that they needed. Um, so there was some kind of agreement, but it could be a painful lesson. And so soulmates would fall into that category, as well as people who are good and kind to you, but who are in your life for only a certain um, a, a certain percentage of time, like they could be in your life for a year, two years, but they made a big impact on you and then they moved on. So I would put Wayne Dyer as soulmate. If I was using that term, I would put him as soulmate because he actually changed the trajectory of my life, but he was only in my life for four years, but he made a huge impact and completely changed the trajectory of my life. But I would describe Danny as a twin soul because I feel that we were meant to journey this together. And I, I have no doubt in, my, um, in every cell of my body that, um, he, that we will only part physically in death, but even beyond death, we will be together. In other words, only death will separate us physically um, for a limited period of time. And then after death, we will still be together. But I, there is no part of me that believes that I have to be or do or behave a certain way to hold on to him. We don't control each other. There is no part of either of us that believes that each one of us will leave the other. It's just a non-negotiable. We're in it together for bad, for good, for whatever. We're, we're twin souls. We are like two halves of one whole. And each one of us um, are, I guess in a sense, this may sound unhealthy and dysfunctional, but I'm gonna risk saying it anyway. But we can't complete our purpose in this life without the other. We are like two halves of one whole. And that seems to be the mission we signed up for. Um, I don't think our, um, our relationship is dysfunctional, um, but then that's just me, maybe because I'm in it, because we are two very different, very independent people. Um, we, don't, we don't manipulate each other to stay in the relationship. We actually feel that we're in it because we've chosen to. So we don't qualify for a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the things that qualify for a dysfunctional relationship. Sorry to go on and on, but yeah, but we do feel like um, we're in it together and we won't, you know, yeah, we signed up for this to be together. So to me, that's a twin soul. Uh, twin souls don't, um, don't manipulate each other, don't, are, are not in the relationship to hurt each other through a lesson like that. That's, again, that's my interpretation. I don't use those words only because different people have different interpretations. Um, it's like when you use the word God, it can be a really charged word. And it's not that I don't believe in God, but it's just that I have a definition of what it means to me when I use the word God and different people have different definitions. I believe that God is within all of us. We are all facets and expressions of God, but some people believe that God is actually a being outside of us. And um, that's not my understanding, which is why I tend not to use the word God, but there you have it. And thank you for that question. I'm really glad you asked that question. And I think I should take just one more if we have one um, before I sign off and we turn to Danny. Are you willing to take two questions? Yes. The first question has been posted by at least 10 people. Ooh, okay. Where's the next cruise? <laughs> Okay, so this is my opportunity to ask you guys a question. Um, if you were to come on a cruise, where do you want to go? One of the things on my bucket list is to see the Northern Lights. I mean, wouldn't that be fun? 
Um, and I, but I believe that cruise would have to leave from Europe. So I need you to tell me because I get different people telling me that, oh, you got to do a cruise from Europe. And then people say, oh, but if you do it from Europe, people from America won't come there. And then I have other people say, do, do a cruise out of Australia, out of Sydney. Now I would love to do that. So I need you to tell me, I want to do all of them. We'll cover them all at some point, but tell me, uh, and I will listen to you. Where do you want me to do the next cruise? Where should it leave from? And here's another question I have from you. I felt seven days was too short. How many of you are able to get away for two weeks? I mean, do you want a seven day cruise or a two week cruise? Bear in mind also that for a two week cruise, it's a bigger commitment. You have to leave work for that long if you work. Um, and of course it costs more for a two week cruise. So, um, and then the producers, they need a minimum number of people before they're willing to do this for me. So this is where I need your support. I really need to hear from you. Um, for those that went on the cruise, you know that it was pretty magical for all of us and I love doing them. So you let me know. Um, do you want a one week cruise, two week cruise, and where do you think I should go next? I'd love, love, love to hear from you. So thank you. That was a great question. <laughs> it makes me excited to think about it. I think in the last 30 seconds, we've had about uh, 30 people who said Northern Lights, Northern Lights. <laughs> okay, let's do it. I think I think we should give it a few hours before we count up the uh, the totals. Okay, I won't commit to anything just yet. I'm going to leave this, um, and this video is going to go on to YouTube, and then I'm going to read the YouTube comments, and it's going to go on my newsletter, and we'll see the comments from people who write back from the newsletter, and let's see where should we go next. And remember, I want to know one week or two weeks. <laughs> The final question yes. from Katie Grigo. My husband passed two weeks ago. Oh. Two weeks later, I received a text about a litter of puppies of a breed I've always wanted. Can he arrange something like this from the other side? <laughs> oh, yes. And if so, how? Oh, yes, he can arrange something like that from the other side. Now, I don't know if I can exactly explain how, but I, let me try. So I, when I crossed over to the other side, I realized that I had lost my ability to speak. Of course, we have no vocal cords. We are pure energy, pure essence, pure love. And everything we do is from a place of love when you are without all your layers of conditioning and your dramas. You leave all that behind with your physical body. You take with you all the good stuff, all the love, um, all the lessons you learned and the experiences. You take it to contribute it to the whole. Now the people you love, you want to guide them. And what you do is when, you, because you know, you know, your, your husband loves you so much he was aware that someone who had a litter of puppies of a breed that you've always wanted, he was aware and he was able to connect them to you by planting the idea in their head to text you or to text somebody who knew you. Um, and they thought it was their own idea, just like the guy the, who put the unicorn next to the elephant in my room on the cruise ship in the same way your husband planted the thought in someone's head to text somebody who, who knew you or to text you. I'm not sure who you got the text from or who he got the, uh, how he got your number, but it is by planting thoughts. And that is something that they absolutely can do. And that's how you get your messages. And that's why we don't always interpret it as messages from our loved ones. When I'm with Milena, very often on my trips and cruises and um, travels, she gets the message uh, or she gets the thought that we both then know has definitely come from Wayne. Like she gets the thought to tell me, stand over there, stand over there. Now, for, and this is specifically like when we are traveling and doing the social media things, Wayne gives me ideas when I am actually sitting on that stage or standing on that stage and delivering. And there's stuff that comes through me that I don't even know how I know. It just comes. 
and I know it's from Wayne and I can easily take the credit for it and say, oh yeah, I thought of this, this came from my brain. No, most of us, our brains are actually not that creative. Our brains are an organ, they are a biological, they have a biological function and their biological function is to keep our bodies running. But our consciousness is what is connected to the all that is. And this is why we don't, there's a lot of things that we try and figure out. How do I do this? How do I do that? You don't have to figure it out. You just have to let the idea go and let all of that take care of it and plant the right ideas in the right uh, people's minds and the right people will come to you. And the more focused you are on trying to make it happen, the harder it is to plant things in your mind or the harder it, harder it is for you to see the signs and the signals or to receive the messages. So, um, so just relax, allow, trust, trust that a lot of the insights you're getting are coming from somewhere higher than you. It's not being generated by your brain. Um, and thank you for tuning into this. And I just want to say that I am doing an online course, an online five-week course with the Shift Network. So in the interim, for those of you who tell me that you're unable to travel to my events, um, on this five-week course, I am going to try and recreate a lot of what I do on my, at my events. So it's a lot easier and cheaper than coming to one of my events. Um, and we will be able to do exercises like have you get into breakout groups and do energy experiments. And, and you will be able to interact with me via Zoom video during this course. So it's a five week course with the Shift Network. Um, and it is about journeying beyond the veil. And we will be doing <clears throat> meditations and you will get the opportunity to interact with me uh, via video. I am going to include a link here so that you can just find out more information about it if you're interested in joining me. I would love for you to join me. It is my first ever online course and it is with the Shift Network. If this course is successful, then of course it means that it, it means that I can do more online courses with you so that we won't just have um, events uh, on cruise ships because that's what I love. So basically it'll be online courses and cruise ships and of course meeting like this um, over YouTube or Facebook. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for all your messages. I love all your comments. I'm, I so apologize. I can't respond to each of you individually, but I love, love, love hearing from you. Thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Same time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.